everyone. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world, we are really broadcasting globally. Uh, so welcome to our mentorship lecture. I'm Dr. Chiara Gabbi, and I'm one of the co-directors of the Eurocolangionet uh, mentoring program. Uh, Eurocolangionet is a program founded by the European Commission under the Cost Action Founding Mechanism that wants to promote uh, the cooperation of uh, scientists active in the field of a form of liver cancer called cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, last year, our network during the pandemic wanted to uh, establish a program to support junior scientists inside our network and to support the career development of junior scientists. We established a mentoring program, an international mentoring program, and this year, together with the second edition, we are today inaugurating a cycle of mentoring lectures. Uh, we want with this lecture to support not only scientists in the field of liver diseases, uh, but also scientists in the general medical field and in, in all the fields of science. Uh, so our program is uh, uh, this year is uh, in cooperation with the European Cholangiocarcinoma Network, the International Cholangiocarcinoma Research Network, and our lectures uh, are endorsed by the European Association for the Study of Liver Disease and the United European Gastroenterology. And we really thank all of them for the support and the partnership in, in our program. Uh, it's my pleasure now to uh, leave the floor to Professor Domenico Alvaro. Uh, Professor Alvaro um, is uh, the scientific and legal representative of the cost action uh, for the grant holder, University La Sapienza in Rome. And he is the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Orthodontics of uh, uh, University La Sapienza in Rome. Uh, Professor Alvaro, um, welcome. Thank you, Chiara. Thank you, Vincenzo, for your effort in organizing this activity. I still remember more than five years ago when the activity of the, our network started doing uh, research and uh, uh, exploiting research on the field of liver disease and cholangiocarcinoma. Now, as a dean of our medicine faculty, I'm very proud that this activity are expanding, including mentoring, because mentoring is very important activity uh, uh, for a younger researcher. Let me thank uh, the uh, very uh, outstanding uh, speaker in this activity, starting with the, uh, Ruth uh, Gautian, uh, with Jeff Sperre Anderson, and this map for the presence that is honoring my faculty and also our activity. Why is very important mentoring? Because the mentoring, uh, uh, the purpose of mentoring is to connect an individual who has a lot of knowledge and experience with someone who hasn't gained the same knowledge or experience. By having someone who knows more than yourself, share advice, offer guidance, and be a sounding board for your thoughts, you stand to benefit from experience beyond your own. In your career or life, having a mentor is crucial to all of our continued growth and de de development. A mentor is someone who helps you uh, grow your skills, make better decisions, and gain new perspective on your life and career. As a mentee, your mentor will leverage their experience to give you guidance on your career or life now and in the future. Rather than lear uh, learning through trial or error, a mentor is a person you can look for a direction and give you a role model to imitate. So Professor Gautian, Jesper, and Dioma are the best people that you, young researcher, may have to increase your uh, skill and to uh, improve your career. So please uh, listen carefully and her works and suggestions. Thank you and start uh, uh, this side of webinar. Thank you very much, Chiara and Vincenzo Thank you. for your effort.
Thank you, Professor Alvaro. Thank you also for everything you are doing in coordinating the Eurocolangionet network. It's really precious what you do. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce you our moderators today, Dr. Isioma Egbuniwe and Professor Jesper Andersen. Uh, they, Professor Andersen served as a mentor in our Eurocolangionet mentorship program, and the, uh, Dr. Isioma Egbuniwe uh, was, uh, was a mentee last year in our program. Uh, it's my pleasure to leave the floor to them and they will uh, uh, guide the discussion and the lecturing with our guests. Thank you very much, Chiara. Um, so hello, everyone. Without further ado, um, I'd like to um, introduce our speaker for today, um, Professor Ruth Gautian. Um, Professor Gautian is the Chief Learning Officer and Assistant Professor of Education in Anesthesiology um, and former Assistant Dean of Mentoring and Executive Director of the Mentoring Academy at Weill Cornell uh, Medicine in the US. She has been hailed by journals, uh, Nature Journal and Columbia University as an expert in mentorship and leadership development. Um, in 2021, she was selected as one of 30 people worldwide um, to be named to the Thinkers 50 Radar list, which is dubbed the Oscars of Management uh, Thinking. And by August of the same year, she was shortlisted as one of the top eight emerging management thinkers in the world. She's also a semi-finalist for the Forbes 50 over 50 list. Um, in addition to publishing in academic journals, Professor Gauthier is a co uh, contributor to Forbes um, and Psychology Today, where she writes about optimizing success. Her research is about the mindset and skill set um, of peak performers, including Nobel, uh, Nobel laureates, astronauts, and Olympic champions. Her forthcoming book, The Success Factor, will be out um, next January, and I'm sure we'll all look out for that. So, um, Professor Gorchen, it's a, uh, an honor and a pleasure to have you speaking to us today, and I'll give you the floor. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Buongiorno. I am really, really excited to be here with all of you. And while I take you through this crash course on mentoring, I am hoping that you can grab a pen and a paper so that by the time we are done together, my goal, and this we're doing this very quickly, is that you would actually have the structure for your own mentoring team. So you're going to leave our time together knowing who should be on your mentoring team. Now, while, while you're grabbing that piece of paper, I want to draw your attention for those of you who are live tweeting or doing anything like that um, during the talk, because you want to share the knowledge that you're hearing today. Um, I put everything there is just my name. And now I would love to draw your attention to the picture on the screen. I don't know how many of you have seen this picture. It came out about a year ago. It was a huge deal in the United States. Our highest court, the Supreme Court, lost one of its major figures, major judges. And that judge was Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She died a little over a year ago. And this was at the peak of the second wave of COVID. Now she had, as a judge, and throughout her entire career, she had hundreds of clerks, people who worked for her. These were usually people who were law students at the time. And what happened when she died, her casket was brought to the, the Supreme Court and all of her former clerks, over 100 of them, came to Washington DC in the United States to stand in formation, as you see here in this picture, to give their last respect and honor to their mentor, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I thought, what, what kind of a person must she have been for all these people to fly in? Remember, this was before the vaccines, to fly in in the middle of the pandemic to pay this kind of respect for her. So I spoke to several of her former law clerks for a Forbes article I wrote to find out what she was like. And I had realized that no matter where you stand on the political spectrum, they had an enormous respect for her 
as a mentor. They couldn't see not coming to pay their final respects. So my goal for all of you is that one day you become a mentor like Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and also that you have a mentor like Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So hopefully by now you have that pen and paper available. And I want to introduce you to Brianna. Brianna is a mentee of mine, but it started in a very unusual way. I was giving a talk and uh, you know, these scientific meetings, they're usually in these beautiful places. This is pre-COVID, usually near a body of water and they have breaks in between. And I had finished my talk and, and we had a break and I was walking by the pool and I noticed Brianna and I recognized her from the session. Now, I don't know if you could see, she has very curly hair. I have very curly hair. And when one curly girl sees another curly girl right away, before we even introduce ourselves and say our name, we ask, how do you control the frizz? How do you keep the bounce? What product do you use? And we have an entire conversation about curly hair. Well, we continued this conversation. And then I was giving a talk several months later at the Burroughs Welcome Fund, and Brianna happened to be there. And you'll see one day we'll have the opportunity to meet in person. And when we do a workshop in person, you will see that I actually always mix groups together. So I would put the dean of the faculty with a student in the same group. And that's total, totally normal for any workshop that I run. And I was watching Brianna because I got to know her through our curly conversation. And I started discussing with her and watching her how she makes her point in front of somebody who's more senior to her, how she listens, how she pushes, how she pulls back, and really how she's reflecting on things. Now, you know, after you finish a conference, you get all of these ideas and you want to bring them back to your institution. You're so excited, but then you get back to work and the work just starts. You don't have time to actually implement all these great things that you learned. We didn't want that to happen. So after that, that workshop that I gave at the Burroughs Welcome Fund, we opened up a Slack channel, everyone started communicating, and Brianna shared all this data that she found online. We were talking about diversifying the physician scientist workforce, that was our, our main topic. And she found all of this data. So I said to her, she was only a first or second year MD PhD student, MD, PhD student at that time. And I said, you know, Brianna, this is really good information. I think you should publish it. And she said, well, I've never published before. I don't, I don't know how to do it, where to start, who would be interested. So I said, well, I have. So for months, we actually got together and we were talking and we were writing and we were editing. And anyone who writes with me, if they write the first draft, they are first author. So Brianna became a first author on her very first paper, and it was in a major journal, the Journal of Clinical Investigation, JCI. That was her first paper, and she was first author. And from there, she has been nonstop. She has been publishing in every major academic journal. And this is all a mentorship relationship that started over curly hair. Because at the end of the day, we got to know each other as people. And that is the basis of all good and pure mentoring relationships. And I have learned just as much from Brianna as she has learned from me. We made video abstracts as well for this paper that we did. And she showed me how to get it into such a short amount of time that we can also put it on Twitter where it went kind of viral. That's something that I learned from her. It's a mentoring relationship that goes both ways. And those are really the best kind. So if you remember nothing else, I want you to remember that the mentoring relationships that start under for that pure relationship, those are the ones who, which will succeed the most. Now, usually we hear these four definitions, role model, mentor, coach, and sponsor. They're four different things, but I just want to make sure we're all using the same vernacular. So a role model is someone you want to become, even if you never meet them, but there's something about them which you wish to emulate. So for example, I interview, you heard, I study extreme high achievers, the Nobel Prize winners and the astronauts and the Olympic champions. 
And when I interview them, I want them to feel like they are the only person in the room. My role model for that is Oprah. I'm never going to meet Oprah, but you know, when she interviews someone, she makes them feel like there's no one else there. They are the only two having that conversation. And that's what I want the people who I interview to feel like. A mentor is someone who talks with you. It is long-term. They actually have two roles. One is the career development aspect, and the other is the psychosocial support, because you know, especially in research, not all days are good days. In fact, they're more bad days than good days. So they're the ones that help you um, get out of that funk, and they're, they're your cheerleader on your side. Now, the coach is someone who talks at you. It's for something very specific, usually for a finite period of time. They will help you come get over imposter syndrome, have executive presence. If I will give a TED talk, I will hire a coach who can help me with storytelling. Now, a sponsor is somebody who talks about you, usually when you're not even in the room. They're the ones who recommend you for talks and promotions and awards and opportunities. So role model, mentor, coach, and sponsor. Four different things, four different roles. It could be four different people, two people, or any variation thereof. Now, I want you to open up your chat now. And I've been talking about you know all the, this great stuff that mentors can do. I want to know why you think you should have a mentor. If you could please put that in the chat. Why have a mentor? Why bother? Please put in the chat why you should have a mentor. I see career development and honest career advice, reach my potential in a guided way, feel cared for and valued, bounce ideas for a career path because nobody has a straight path. Become a better professional in my career. Build the future. Get advice for professional career. Learn from their example. Highlight what I am not good at. All excellent answers. Keep them coming in because I want you to see what's written on the chat and read other people's responses so that you can learn from them as well. Now you guys know the answer. Why have a mentor? You said it. They have experience you don't have, perspective that you don't yet have. They have skills that they can teach you. And they also have what we call political or social capital. It's who they know and who they are willing to introduce you to. So please tell me in the chat, for those of you that have mentors, what is the best thing your mentor ever did for you? Please put it in the chat. Show me some of the great stuff. They offered career development, excellent. Enhanced my network. Believing in me and guiding, found the best of myself when I was not aware of it. Open new ideas. supported me in publishing a major textbook in the field, provided references for networking. All superb, superb. Keep them coming because again, I want you to learn from each other. And you guys are right. There's a ton of benefits to finding a mentor. And there's a lot of research that's been done on this. Those who are mentored out earn and outperform those who are not mentored. So I always tell people when we're in person, raise your hand if you have a mentor. And then I tell everyone who doesn't have their hand raised, look at those people who have their hand raised because they're gonna make more than you. Because a mentor says it's time to put your hat in the ring and, and go after a promotion. It's time to ask for a raise. They give you that nudge that you need. 
So those who are mentored, they also have higher job and career satisfaction and lower burnout, which as we know is really hurting the medical and scientific community right now. Those who are mentored, they have more publications. Remember that Brianna story? For those of you who are physician scientists, those who are mentored actually get more protected research time. Now also those who are mentored have what's called a higher self-efficacy, meaning even if they've never done the job before, they have the confidence that they can figure it out. They will ask the right people. They will get the job done. So if you want to be like Professor Alvaro, a dean of faculty, there's no class or course or school on how to become one. But if you have the higher self-efficacy, you know that you will figure this out even if you've never done it before because you know how to surround yourself with the right people who can fill in those gaps for you and advise you as needed. So it's not just about self-confidence, it's also self-efficacy. Now, while we know that it'll help the mentee, it's not just all about you you are actually really expensive and replacing you is really hard and expensive to do. So those who are mentored actually have greater loyalty to the institution. So it helps with retention as well. So a lot of benefits to having a mentor. Now there's also a lot of mentors who don't do a good job. And I know we have all had this Tell me in the chat, what is it the bad things that your mentor did? What is some of the things? You don't need to mention them by name, but what did they do? I can't believe I'm the only one that had a bad mentor before. Here we go, not engaging effectively sometimes, not wanting to move me uh, out of his or her lab. That's right. Did any of you have a paper you submitted to your mentor and it was sitting there for weeks or months? Not giving me independence. Lack of investment of time all true. I want you all to look at these comments and keep putting them in because this bad mentorship is actually worse than no mentorship. And I want you to see that if you have experienced it, you're really not alone. Unfortunately, it's more common than we think because people don't usually get trained on how to be a good mentor. So here we have another comment, somebody who highlighted my weakness more than my strength. Absolutely. So there's actually two major categories of how mentors fail. It's called active mentorship malpractice and passive mentorship malpractice. This is actually by my friends, Vineet Chopra and Sanjay Saint. They, they wrote about this in JAMA. The active mentorship, the hijacker who takes the mentee's idea as their own. Or how about the explorer who gives the mentee low yield activities so that they could never get their independence and never produce anything? Or the possessor who's very domineering over their mentee and does not want the mentee to get any assistance or collaborate with anyone else because they see it as a threat to their position. Have any of you ever experienced a hijacker, an exploiter or possessor? Let me know which one. Put in the chat if you are, if you experience being the mentee of a hijacker, exploiter, or possessor. Here they come. All of them, exploiter, exploiter. They're real. They're definitely real. Now let's look at those passive mentorship malpractice. The bottleneck, that's the mentor who has no bandwidth and no desire to help the mentee. They just like the title. So they say, yes, I'll mentor you, but they don't have the time or the bandwidth or the interest in actually helping you with those two roles that we talked about, your career development and the psychosocial support. Or how about the country club or everyone's friend, 
but avoids those difficult conversations. They are not good with difficult conversations, so they avoid conflict. Or the world traveler, this is obviously pre-COVID, they're always on the road and they don't have time to check in, not even by email, text, WhatsApp, Slack. They're busy, they're traveling and they cannot check in. Let me know in the chat if you have been a mentee of some of a bottleneck, a country clubber or a world traveler. Oh, here we go, here they come, lots of travelers. Yep. You see, when I asked people how many had a, a toxic mentor, a few, a few wrote. And when I started breaking it up into the active and passive mentorship malpractice, you see that it's a lot more common than you thought. And maybe you're recognizing it. Now you heard that I interview Olympians and I, one of the groups that I got to interview a lot were rowers. I think this is called the skull, right? And one thing that I have learned is that every person on the skull, on this boat, has a different role. Every single one brings something else. And a team of mentors is the exact same thing. Everything that a single mentor can do, a team of mentors, it's just amplified. It's like on steroids. It's multiple perspectives. You can tap into multiple experiences and you can tap into all of those networks. So these are the types of people who should be in your mentoring team. Now, usually they, everyone thinks it's, oh yeah, someone senior in my department and that's great, but I want you to think even bigger than that. I want you to think in your field as well as outside of your field, in your industry and outside of your industry. If, every, if you're a gastroenterologist and all of your mentors are gastroenterologists, guess what? That's the only way you're going to think. If everyone who you, who you work with is in academic medicine, you're always going to think like someone in academic medicine, you will have blinders on. It's as if the rest of the world doesn't have ideas. Now, how about a community of practice? This group that you are a part of, this webinar that you're watching, this group, you're all part of a community of practice, which means you have a sim similar goals, you have ways of communicating with each other, and you can tap each other for different ideas. This is the best kind of community of practice that you can be a part of. Obviously, people who have project experience. I was chatting with Professor Alvaro before. He told me that he worked for a while in the United States at Yale. There are people there with project experience that he was able to tap into. Now, obviously we want people who are senior to us. They have all of these things. We also want people who are at our level for many reasons, they can empathize with us. They understand what we're going through. I always share the example that the president of Simmons University in the United States and the Dean of Wharton, the number one business school, they're best friends. And they met as graduate students in their twenties as grad students because peers rise together. And now one's the president of the university and the, one, the other one is a Dean. Now, how about people who are junior to you? They can help you. They absolutely can teach you something. I learned Twitter from someone two generations younger than me. I am now helping a Nobel Prize winner to market his book. He's a brilliant physician scientist, but doesn't know the first thing about marketing his book. I have a book coming out. I, it's my second one. I just had a crash course in it. Now, don't forget the retirees. The retirees have the time, have the experience, they know the politics of the organization, and they would love to help out. It's actually something in psychology called generativity, people who want to give back and be helpful. So now it's time to grab that piece of paper that I told you about, and that pen. And I want you to draw this bullseye, and I want you, at the middle of the bullseye, I want you to write your name. Now on the very top, I want you to write your next goal. What is your next goal? So people tell me I wanna get a, a grant. Getting a grant is not a goal. 
getting a grant is a milestone towards a goal. Do you want to uh, get promoted to full professor? Is that your next goal? It might be if you're associate professor, if you're assistant professor, there might be a few more levels. So what is your next goal? And then what the plan, what are three things you need to do in order to meet that goal? So let's say your goal is to become associate professor. Your plan is to publish in specific journals, give more talks and develop your network so that you can get those letters of recommendation. Now in this bullseye, we're going to find the people who can help you with that. You put your name in the beginning, in the center, the circle right outside that, who are the people who know the personal you? They know you when you're tired. They know you when you're hungry. They know you when you're sleep deprived. You might have been in lockdown during, during the uh, lockdown of COVID. You might have been with them. These could be your parents, your partner, your children, your roommate. Who are those people? These are the people who know the personal you write their names down. And it's very important to list them because these are the people who love us unconditionally and they will give us the hard truth. They will give us that feedback even when we don't wanna hear it, but sometimes we need to. Who are those people? Now the next circle are the people who know you, the professional you. They know what you are like when you are under a deadline and when you're stressed and you don't have enough resources. And when you're, um, when you're helping patients in the middle of the pandemic, they see you, they're there with you side by side. Who are those people? They know the professional you. Write down their names. And now the outer circle. These are leaders in your field that with one or two introductions, you can actually get to meet them. Who are those people? Write down their names. Now you will start noticing as you start advancing in your field, the people from the outer circle will start to move in and you will have additional people that you add. Now, what's important with the mentoring team, they don't even need to know of each other's existence. They don't all need to get together. This is not a, a dissertation defense. You call on the people you need based on who you need at that time. So when I was preparing my book proposal for my, my upcoming book, The Success Factor, I actually went to one of my mentors who is a brilliant writer and wrote many books and I asked her to look it over. I said, can you please give me your insights? What am I missing? What should I consider? I didn't show it to the lawyer on my mentoring team who has never written a book. He would not have been helpful there. However, when I wanna talk about negotiation, I'm not talking to the writer, I'm talking to the lawyer. So you want these different people on your mentoring team and you call on whoever you need as you need them. So my mentoring team has people from medicine, science, law, education, business, military. You never know where you might need somebody. Now, it could be these people, it's not a life sentence to be a mentor. So if somebody is not working out so well, you have other people that you can pick from. You don't just have one mentor because if that person leaves the organization, are you, you just stuck without anyone and you have to start again? That's why you really wanna have this robust mentoring team. I want you to walk around with this piece of paper, add names, subtract names as you need it. And every time you're going through a transition, such as a new job, a promotion, uh, another child, a move, a pandemic, whatever the transition is, take this paper out and see if people need to be shuffled around, if you need to add people or certain people sort of go out there to the outskirts, see what it is that you need. And there you have it. There are the, the skeleton for your mentoring team. I told you you would have it. 
for those that this might have been a little too fast or you're like me, you're an extrovert and things need to just simmer and resonate a little bit, no problem. Here are a bunch of articles that I've written um, for different journals about mentoring, peer mentoring, mentoring teams. Um, and if you want to download a worksheet on that, you can for free. It's I put it on my website, ruthgotian.com slash mentoring team. So feel free to do it, do it on your own time, share it with who, whoever you want. It's there for you to use. Um, and you can always uh, contact me for these articles or um, any others. Now we've been through a pandemic and we don't have time to go through all of this, but I do wanna tell you that mentoring has shifted the way we mentor during a pandemic. It, it changed at the beginning and it's changing now as we start to go back to normal or back in person, um, but it's not the way it used to be. And I just wanna tell you that there are a lot of tips on how to do it effectively. I had someone in April of 2020, the height of their pandemic was asking their mentee to please start working on the aims for the grant. The person came to me crying because they had the children at home, they had the parents they were worried about, they couldn't even think about the grant. So here is a way to really just do it a little bit better. There's two articles that I wrote in Nature about this if you want to read it and just get a little bit more information. Uh, this one about mentoring during transitions is actually, if you go to Nature, their podcasts, um, my co-author and I, Chris Fund, um, actually talk about that. So if you're a better learner through Audible, um, that might work for you. And I really tried to keep it to half an hour, but what kind of an educator would I be if I didn't leave you some resources? So here are some of my favorites. I'm a big reader. I read 70 to 100 books a year. So here are some of my favorites on mentoring. This one, Tim Ferriss, if you ever read the four hour work week, he wrote Tribe of Mentors. This is a fun one. Um, Athena Rising by my friends Brad Johnson and David Smith. It says it's for how men should mentor women, but it's actually for anybody who's mentoring. I have read this multiple times. I know them well. I, I think everybody should read this. It's not just about mentoring women. This is my book that has multiple chapters on mentoring, including how to develop your mentoring team, how to mentor people um, of different genders, cultures, time zones, you name it. The Mentoring Guide by Vineet Chopra and Sanjay Saint talks about, they're the ones who wrote about the mentorship malpractice, the active and passive mentoring. So they have a fun little guide um, which it, it's a small book. It fits in your, in your bag. It's, it's a great one. The mentor project is where I volunteer. If you like watching videos, there's thousands of hours of some of the most successful people in the world who want to give back. Um, LinkedIn learning, if you have access to it or any of those kinds of platforms where you can learn everything from Sequel to Executive Presence has a ton on mentoring. I'm going to have a couple of courses there as well coming out in a few months. And Forbes or Inc., any of those journals, Entrepreneur, Fast Company, I wrote Forbes because I write there, um, they have a lot on mentoring as well. And I really do hope that we can continue to keep in touch. I love having friends from all over the world. I put a lot of my information there, as I said, my website, Ruth Gautian, my book, The Success Factor. Here is the QR code for LinkedIn for those who want to connect there, or Instagram, Twitter. And I really would love to have a conversation with you in our remaining time. And I realize that some people, it's, it's more challenging to come up with questions. What am I supposed to ask? So I put actually sentence starters for you to maybe trigger trigger your brain as to what you might want to either ask or add value to. So maybe there was something that I said that really struck a chord with you because you had a similar experience or it resonated with you, or you had a mentor who did something like that, or there was something that I said that you can relate to. So I would love it if we would have a chat about this. I'm going to leave this up for a few more seconds. I thank you very much 
for your time and indulging me. And I am excited to have this chat with you guys. Back to the moderators. Thank you very much, Ruth. And uh, for all of those uh, listening in, uh, please write your uh, questions uh, in, the, in the chat and uh, Isuma or I will uh, address them to, to Ruth. So uh, Ruth, maybe I, I can start uh, uh, with, with this discussion uh, with you. Uh, so could you maybe put some words on, uh, on the interaction between a mentor and a mentee? When you are a mentor, what do you expect of the mentee? And also in your role as a mentee, what do you expect of your mentor? So I, I think, first of all, I would say forget titles. Because when you're asking someone to be your mentor, what does that mean exactly? You're asking them to do everything for you. You don't ask somebody to be your friend. So why would you really ask them to be your mentor? Because when somebody asks me to be their mentor, I, I just, I panic for a minute because I don't have the time. When am I going to do this? How am I going to do it effectively? I don't want to be that, that country club or that world traveler, the one that doesn't have the bandwidth. When you ask someone to be your mentor, you're almost, it's as if you're asking them to take on another obligation. So instead, have, remember that Brianna story, that organic conversation where you're developing a relationship. So don't worry about giving them a title. So instead of asking them to be your mentor, ask them for their perspective. Tell them a challenge you're working on. You know they have expertise. Could you have 15 minutes of their time? You really just want to get their perspective or, or their thoughts about it after they have proven themselves to help you with the career development and the psychosocial support, then they have earned that title of mentor, which only the mentee can give. A mentor can't give that title to themselves. So don't worry about titles so much. Work on developing that relationship. You wouldn't ask someone to marry you on your first date. So don't ask someone to be your mentor the first time you meet them. Instead, get to know them and get to know their perspective and see what value they can add as well. And I think you'll get a lot more out of that relationship. So, so do you not in, um, in that relationship of course I, 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 when it's a natural dynamic process uh, you meet somebody and slowly it merges into a mentor mentee pro setting but when it, we are talking more like here um, uh, in the ENSCA and the international cancer network colonial carcinoma network um, where is an organized program uh, mm -hmm. we have some that are set up like a mentor that would be me we have more people that are asking to have mentors like Isuma yeah. did in the, in the last year's program uh, and so forth. Um, what in a more organized setting um, do you expect in the two different roles uh, uh, that the personalities take up? Like I, I, try, I try to usually uh, set some tasks in the beginning to actually map out what the mentee and in, in, in my mentee in this situation uh, expects of me. Uh, uh, by actually, it's very um, um, maybe maybe very classical. But I, I somewhat asked them to to um, in in the initial thing tell them their their own story, uh, and then yeah. ask for a, a, in the second meeting if one still wants to have this role together, uh, both from the mentor's perspective but also from the mentee. We can of course cancel it after the first uh, first round if it does just doesn't yep. work. Uh, but it, if it works, uh, I ask usually for some type of a SWOT analysis uh, to, to in the plus minus side of this problem or this setting that you have, because uh, I think it can be dangerous to actually, uh, for the mentor to kind of give solutions, right? Uh, you, you know, the task mm -hmm. is not really a solution making process, but more than tweaking out that you yourself, the mentor yes. comes with the solution. Yes, you said the perfect thing. If a mentor is giving you answers to everything, how are you ever going to learn? If I'm always going to tie my children's shoes, how are they going to learn to tie their own shoes? But this is, this is what has to happen. A mentor, and if you do it as a formal or informal, that's a whole separate conversation. Formal is fine if there's an exit ramp. If it's not working anymore, the mentor can say, I'm too busy, it's not working, whatever it is, so that they can get off. And the mentee can say, this is not the right fit for me, for whatever reason, right? That's fine. But the mentee has to come up with the goal and has to come up with the plan. 
That's why when we did that mentoring team, it actually started with your name in the middle, the mentee's name in the middle. What's your goal? What are we doing here? What are we working toward? And what are the three things you're going to work on to help you achieve that goal? That's up to the mentee to come up with that. And then the mentor can help them refine that goal and refine that plan. Oh, you need to publish more papers because you want to be an associate professor. That's great. Let's look at the research projects you're working on. Let's see who can help add value. Let's see who I should introduce you to. Let's look over your experiments. Let's look over your writing. Your writing doesn't flow well. I really want you to work with someone who can really tighten up your writing and do well. Those are things that the mentors can do. That would be so helpful. But you're right. If they're coming up with all the answers, the mentee is never going to learn and never going to get independence. So that uh, potentially leads us into a question from uh, Gabi, uh, Kiara Gabi, who, has, who is asking how to deal with a bad mentor when he, yeah. uh, he she is uh, also your boss. Oh, that's a sticky situation. Um, and that's why you need that's why you need a mentoring team. Because those toxic mentors are worse than no mentors. And there's actually quite a bit of research on this, that people who have this bad mentor will never seek out another mentor again. And we know that those who are mentored well outperform and out earn. But this is where you actually need to have a mentoring team. So there are other people who can weigh in because if it's an active or a passive mentorship malpractice, how you deal with it is very different. Right. And sometimes you need the help of someone else who is more senior. You need someone at your level. Um, you know, I might say, Professor Anderson, I know you have a lot of travel coming up. I am under a very tight deadline. I, I know you're not going to be able to do this right now. I am going to work with Professor so and so. Until your schedule clears up a little bit, I'll be sure to keep you in the loop so that you always know what's going on because your input is very important to me. But I recognize you're traveling so much, you don't have great Wi Fi, you can't always do it. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> that happens. Uh, I know. Uh, so you have a question, so a more clarifying uh, point actually from uh, Kartik. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, so a mentor is a mix of a coach and a sponsor. Not really. Mm -hmm. um, a mentor is really someone who helps you long term with your career. A coach is works higher, on right? very specific skills. Yeah, a mentor very often does not get paid. A coach gets paid a lot. Hmm. Um, and there, it's for very specific skills. A coach is also, um, it, it's, short, it's for a short term, right? So if I'm working with someone as a coach, it might be for six months to work on very specific things. A sponsor... I think a mentor can definitely be a sponsor and should be a sponsor, um, but they don't have to be. A sponsor is somebody who nominates you for different opportunities. And I just had a, a nature paper come out a week ago that says, if you are a sponsor, you then need to go back to being a mentor and mentor the, whoever you sponsored to help them succeed. So if you sponsored someone to give a talk at an international meeting, and they got it, they got the opportunity. Well, now you need to mentor them on how to do that effectively and figure out who's in the audience, what kind of talk, what's the delivery, what's the culture of the organization, what are the traditions of the organization, take it to that next step. So that's really a mentor, sponsor, mentor continuum. Yeah, that's probably also the hardest uh, to to achieve for, for, for one. And it's, uh, <laughs> we all need, uh, of course, a sponsor somewhere in our career and uh, maybe through the yes. entire, entire time. Another question you have is uh, from uh, Radini. Uh, how do you make a beneficial relationship for a mentor? I asked someone to be my mentor and the question was, how would they benefit I wanted to be better. I wanted to be better prepared next time. I asked this question within an organized program. Yeah. So this is why I don't ever like using the M word. I don't like yeah. asking someone to, to be my mentor because again, it's as if you're asking them to take on another obligation, but just say, 
Professor Anderson, I'm working on a certain project and I know you have expertise in this area. Would it be okay if I just emailed you every so often just to get your input, just to get your perspective? That sounds a lot less daunting than will you be my mentor? Your mentor for yeah, what? Yeah, and I, I also right? think maybe <laughs> if somebody answers back, uh, you have a question to a person or uh, a nurturing role or whatever you're asking for, and then somebody says, what do I benefit? It might be you have to ask somebody else, uh, Rajini. I, I don't know, Ruth, maybe you can comment yeah. on that part as well. Yeah, and also how they would benefit is, is an unusual, <laughs> that's unusual. Exactly, yeah. um, so in the best mentoring relationship, the mentor is actually also learning. They're just learning a little bit differently because the best mentors in the world see the success of their mentees sort of as a notch on their belt. The mentee's success is their success and they're being seen as having an eye for talent. That's actually how they're benefiting. So they're there to really help you develop. There's a reason why most Nobel Prize winners were mentored by other Nobel Prize winners, right? Yeah. So the benefit is that you are constantly learning and you have that new energy coming to you all of the time. So um, maybe in a natural progression of that question, I a large number of scientists are kind of introverted and we kind of in our career push because we have to give presentation, but the presentation yeah. are usually in our work. So you can kind of, you know, put that facade. It's not like a free uh, uh, acting situation is acting on your job, which you are the best yes. at. Uh, so do you have any uh, easy techniques uh, or few techniques that you can give to the audience on uh, how you approach a mentor or one you would like to be a mentor without using the M word uh, for an introverted uh, scientist. Yes. And you know what? Um, so I actually, I actually wrote a paper on networking for introverted scientists, um, which is in nature um, because it's such an issue. It's such a challenge. It's, you know, you have these social mixers where you have to mix with people, but what really happens? We talk to the people who we know. So it really takes just a little bit more advanced planning if you are quieter, if you are more introverted, if you don't like these large groups. If you want to get mentorship guidance, right? Change the word mentorship to guidance from somebody and you're, you're not quite comfortable going up to them, you can ask somebody to introduce you. So if... Um, I want to work on something very specific and I know you, I would ask you, I want to work on, you know, IBD. Mm. Do you know, I, I know professor so-and-so is an expert in the field. Do you know her? Would you be willing to introduce me to her? And then hopefully you'll say yes. And then hopefully we'll find out we're both going to be at the same meeting. And then the mentor will say, why don't I arrange for the three of us to get coffee together at this meeting? That is a great way for a mentor to leverage their network, start with collaborations, right? And help somebody who's quieter find those other people. Now you can, if you're a more introverted scientist, you can certainly reach out to people directly yourself, but it's always better when there's an introduction because when there's an introduction from someone who they know, that's the social proof. They don't need to vet you because if Professor Anderson says you're okay, then you must be okay, right? Right. Yeah, that you know, that makes sense, and the and the the coffee talk uh, usually always always works. Also at uh, at conferences, uh, it's the best That's place right. to in, uh, interact always. with people. <laughs> um, so there's a question uh, from Gabby again here. Uh, if you could give us some notes on gender differences in mentoring and how we can leverage those differences for the best. Yes. Um, so there are differences uh, in gender. I do also uh, want to give tips. I just thought. If you do need to approach somebody on your own, this is going back to the introverted question, um, and you want to know how to start a conversation where you can talk about something other than the weather, um, there's a Forbes article I wrote. You can, if you just look up Forbes Ruth Gotian, there's an article on how to start a conversation with a stranger. 
and there's actually scripts on how to do it. So you can um, definitely check that out. It's also in the book, The Success Factor. Now, how um, uh, gender differences in mentoring. There are absolutely differences. We have the whole Me Too movement. I actually think that um, this was actually one of the benefits of Zooming all the time where women don't need to be so concerned about what it's like to be in a room with a man with the door closed. What are people going to think? What are people going to say? So um, I think that's definitely been one of the, the benefits. Um, there's a book I want to recommend besides the Athena Rising book. There's also a book by Sally Helgeson called How Women Rise. And it really talks about some of the things that women do differently. So for example, we are always apologizing. Women are mm -hmm. always apologizing, right? Instead of saying, thank you for your patience, we say, I'm sorry, we're late, right? So there's all these behaviors that women do, right? We work on, de on developing relationships, but we never leverage those relationships right? We, we bring ourselves into every piece of drama. It takes a piece, a part of us. So mentoring someone who this is innate within them is bring it to their attention and let them know you don't need to apologize all the time. You know, all these amazing people now leverage those relationships, teaching them how to do that and role modeling that will really be helpful. So I will ask my last question, and then I will give the word to Isuma. I'm sure she might also have some burning questions. I uh, just want to take Fatima's uh, Q and A. Uh, if maybe you have some uh, thing you want to add to that, uh, and the question in the Q and A is how to make the best out of long distance mentorship. Uh, should there be a contract between the mentor and the mentee? So really, very um, organized and on paperwork and everything. Uh, and uh, from my side, I will want to thank you, Ruth, for a great uh, talk. And I will also encourage everybody to look at your uh, YouTube uh, presentation. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. And Isma, you take over after this. Thank you. So yes, some people have a contract, a compact. I personally am not a fan of that because I think mentoring, as I said with the Brianna story, it needs to be a relationship. Just like I don't have a contract with my friends, don't really want a contract with a mentor. And really, if there's no enforcement, what good is the contract? And really, do you really want to stay with someone who's no good? Right. So I like the flexibility personally. Right. Um, in terms of long distance mentorship, <laughs> I have mentors I have yet to meet in person. It's all been virtual, but you know what? I communicate with them a lot more than the mentors who I see in person. And if you, it's really about communication. So if you're able to communicate with the person, it really doesn't matter if it's in person or virtual. It's just about the communication and learning each other's communication style. So I, I will share that. Um, I remember when I was getting my doctorate, the person who should have been my mentor and my doctoral dissertation advisor was the chair of my department. She was a world expert in the topic. But as I started talking to her, I realized that her mentoring style did not fit mine. She wanted me to constantly read articles on my own and just figure it out. But what I realized was that I needed to talk it out. I needed to, I read it on my own, but then I want to talk through what worked, what didn't work, what I questions, what I'm challenged with, what I agree with, what I disagree with. And I actually found a mentor who every day on my morning commute to work, I have a long commute, she would call me or I would call her and we would chat for an hour every morning about what I read, what I agreed with, what I didn't, how I would take it a step further. And that actually worked for me. And by the way, it was six months before I ever met her in person. Well, thank you, Ruth. That's been really helpful. Um, I can't see any more questions in the chat, but perhaps in the last few minutes, I could uh, just ask the question um, from the perspective of the mentee, a lot of the time there is um, sort of an imbalance of power because the mentors, I know you talked about peer-to-peer peer -peer mentoring, but a lot of the time, and um, because we seek out mentors 
um, because either we want to model our careers and what they've done, or we want advice on how to progress our careers. Um, there is always, a, even if it's very slight, there's always this imbalance of power, so to speak. And I, I guess the question I wanted to ask is, how do you navigate that relationship where you want to get something out of this relationship, but you are, um, I don't want, maybe hindered is not the right word to use, but you're aware of this yeah. imbalance of power. And then if something does go wrong, because of that imbalance of power and the fact that you're relatively junior, you're maybe kind of stuck and not sure what, what else, what to do. Yes. And that is why you need a mentoring team. Mm. That is exactly why you meet, you need a mentoring team um, to help balance all of that out. But remember, even as a mentee, you have something to offer as well. There's always something that you can offer. If I can mentor a Nobel prize winner, in chemistry, about marketing a book, surely there is something that you can offer your mentor, right? And this yeah. Nobel Prize winner is a generation older than me. He has a Nobel Prize. I don't think I'm ever getting a Nobel Prize, right? So there is always something where you can add value as well. You just yeah. have to figure out what that is. Yeah. And I think the key thing, again, for the mentees, a key thing for the mentees being confident in the fact that yes. you can add value and you do yes. bring value to the relationship. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, um, Ruth. That's been really enlightening. Um, there's no more questions in the chat, but um, are, are you happy to, if people come up, have questions that they think about later, are you happy for questions to be forwarded to you? Absolutely. Um, thank you. Very Absolutely. Much. And they could also look on my website and contact me that way as well. Perfect. All right. Thank um, you. I'm going to hand over to Kia to thank you. the proceeding. Well, uh, Ruth, it was uh, so, so really um, inspiring your lecture. And thanks also to uh, Iziama and Jasper for the, for the wonderful discussion. Uh, so really, thank you. Thank you all for being with us today. As announced, this, was, uh, this is our first mentoring lecture. And I'm really proud and honored to announce the next mentoring lecture. It will be on December 6, 2021, uh, 3.30 PM Central European time. Uh, the title of the lecture will be how to shape a fulfilling career in the field of liver diseases but more in general in the field of, of medicine. Um, so thanks again uh, to everyone for uh, participating and I wish you all the best for the rest of the day and I'm looking forward to meet you again uh, December 6th. Thank you. Thank you.